information. I want to thank everyone for coming to our webinar today. It's entitled Teaching Tips from TVIs for TVIs. And we have a special guest speaker whose name is Patricia Leader, and she is a veteran TVI herself and is going to share some of her own thoughts and help us share some of the tips that we've collected from people that we know uh, in the industry and who are currently teachers or have formerly been teachers. And we've had uh, a lot of fun actually polling people we know and we've had discussions on LinkedIn with different professionals in the industry who teach people either with low vision or who are blind. And we've had um, a lot of great tips come through and we're excited to share those with you. Really quickly, I want to talk about who we are. I work for HIMSS. The webinar is presented by HIMSS. We are an assistive technology manufacturer out of Austin, Texas, and we produce uh, low vision magnifiers, handheld magnifiers, desktop magnifiers, uh, and also braille products and book players for people who are blind. We have 100% US based sales and support out of our Austin, Texas office. And one of the really cool things that we like to brag about is that we have about, on average, a three-day turnaround on all repairs. So should your device need a repair, and hopefully it never does, but should it need a repair, once we get it in our hands in Austin, Texas, it takes about three days before we turn it back around and mail it back to you. And some of the things that we're going to cover today, we are going to go over some general tips for classroom instruction some ideas for inspiring students to excel and to be as independent as possible at home, at school, and later in life at work. Uh, we'll talk about shortcuts and tips for better use of mainstream and assistive technology. We will cover some creative ways to save money and teach Braille in fun and memorable ways. And we'll go over some assistive technology products that can help with instruction and studying and homework uh, and also test taking. I'm going to hand the time over in a minute to Patricia Leader, who is our guest speaker today. Really quickly, I want to give her a little bit of an introduction. She is a veteran TVI. She's been teaching for 37 years now, those who are blind and low vision. She currently is a teacher in the Cupertino Union School District in California and coordinates her district's SELPA 2 program where she supervises five instructional assistants and coordinates instructional teams and referrals. She's also currently serving as an active member of the Board of Trustees of the AFB and as a member of the adjunct faculty of SFSU teaching beginning and advanced Braille and instruction methods. She's a member of the National Braille Challenge Development Team as well, where she helps to author the questions and, for the Braille spelling and proofreading tests and serves as a proctor at the National Braille Challenge competitions. Prior to joining the Cupertino Union School District, Patricia worked as the president of the AERBVI's Field Professionals Organization. And when she's not immersing herself in her work, as you can tell, she's very busy in the industry and in her community, uh, she can be found spending time with her family in San Jose, California, and that includes with her two adult children and her grandchild. So that's uh, kind of a, a really fast introduction to Patricia. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. So we have a, a PowerPoint that we'll be going through, and I'm going to be going through and reading the comments that we have from uh, people all over the country that Tim's has collected. And as I read through these, I'll add some of my other um, hints or tips to go along with them. So first of all, some tips for classroom instruction and, and inspiration. And one of the most important things is organization is critical. It's important to have to know where things are. And as we all know, that if you are a person who's blind or visually impaired, organization is so important. You need to know where you leave things, where you put things, and it's important to have a, a place for things. So it's important that we teach our students that and, and teach them organizational skills and to keep track of their materials and equipment. Low vision students may not register gestures and other visual clues in and out of the classroom. It is important to speak and describe what is being presented while writing on the board or gesturing. We find that our students often can't see 
far in the distance, and we, we need to be able to provide the information that is, that, that is given in a classroom at, the, at a distance, which is where much of the instruction occurs. In addition to instruction, they don't often see their, their um, friends making gestures or facial expressions, and they miss a lot of those social clues. So it's important that we teach our students how to analyze that information when they're with, with their friends, or even in the classroom to find out what, what's going on in the classroom, what the teacher's presenting, and ask the teacher to, to uh, verbally state those things that they're writing on the board, um, as well as things that are around the room to allow the student to, to be able to appreciate the things that are in the room on the walls. It's important to use specific words when describing things or giving directions. If you just say it's over there or this item or that, it means nothing to a person who's blind or visually impaired. And it's important to use more descriptive or, or, or um, um, detailed words that help the, the person know what things you're talking about or just to help to describe them or to know where things are located. Another quote is that developmentally children with a disability can be up to two years behind their peers. The problem is that providing a challenging environment for, for the student. We need to challenge them to complete the task as a person without such a disability and create a learning environment where the student will not fail, progressively increasing the difficulties of the exercises. So as we've learned that our students who are blind and visually impaired don't gather or, or assimilate the same information that other students learn incidentally just by being in an environment. Uh, students pick up information that they catalog in their brains um, and they later on will think, oh, I, yeah, I remember that. That relates to, to what I saw before. But our students miss a lot of those clues in the environment. So it's important that we, we tell them about the things that are around them in their environment to, to help them developmentally approach their age level. Um, we'll talk about this later, but I like to, to tell my instructional assistants and people who are working with students that they need to narrate the environment, describe what's around the students and what's going on and, and what kind of environment they're in to help them gain the same knowledge that their, their sighted peers gain. Technology can also be very helpful um, for students, but we don't want to forget about Braille. Um, we, we want students to be able to hold things and put them in their hands and let them explore things. We need to be patient at the same time holding them to, to high standards and, and allowing them to make mistakes. I think this is really important because so oftentimes parents and also other staff members tend to shelter students who are blind or visually impaired and don't let them experience all that's around them. And by doing that, we, we're shortchanging them and not allowing them um, full access to the environment. Visually impaired or not, children grow up at their own pace and they all have their own skills as well as understanding of the world around them. They like to be independent, to learn things for themselves, and that's very important for taking on challenges later on in their lives. This is a really important statement that was made, and we need to allow children to be independent. So often we jump in immediately to help them, when we see them especially if we see them struggling, and we need to allow them that time to figure things out themselves and problem solve. So that's an important skill to, to impart to our students is problem solving. And we do that just by allowing them to, to maybe um, try things out, maybe fail, and then try something else different until they reach a, um, a solution. Another thing to do is to get teachers to wear different glasses, simulation glasses, designed with various eye conditions and or earplugs for the day if you're simulating a hearing impairment. Make them do life skills like cooking and walking. Show them what they, that they need to be patient. So if we allow teachers, and I've also done this with students in classes, to see a simulation of what a student with a visual impairment or a person with a visual impairment is experiencing, then they have a little bit more patience and understand uh, what they're going through. I taught a mainstreaming course for National University for three years, and that was one of the, the assignments was for people to simulate a, a variety of disabilities so they could get an appreciation for what people with disabilities have to go through. So, go through. Certainly it's not the same as being a disabled per, person with a disability all the time, but it helps them give a little bit better awareness 
of what people go through. And here are some, some tips that um, are for using technology and assistive devices. On the iPad with VoiceOver enabled, you can use three fingers to tap three times on the screen in rapid succession to turn on the screen curtain function. The screen will go blank, but the iPad is still functioning using VoiceOver. Tap the screen three times again with three fingers to turn the screen curtain off. Using the screen curtain increases the battery life of the iPad. More important than that, it allows a person who is blind or visually impaired to have privacy on their phone. Someone sitting next to them can't see who their voicemails or their emails are from or, or what maybe what website they're um, trying to access. It, it's really important to allow them to have their own privacy. And this is one of the features that the um, iPad and also the iPhone has so that you can um, maintain your privacy and, and, um, and, and as it says, increase the battery life of the iPad. When you're creating a PowerPoint presentation that has graphics or images, one of the things you can do is to alt tag those images for screen reading purposes. To do that, you right click on the graphic or image, select format picture, scroll to the bottom of the list and select, select alt tag. Add a title and description there. Once that's completed, if you ever copy and paste that graphic or picture, the alt tag will be on it. And that allows a person who is blind or visually impaired to be able to access that graphic or image when they're um, looking at the PowerPoint presentation. This is another quote, teaching listening skills for use with audible media, comprehension, analysis, etc., can be a big issue that a lot of teacher teachers ask about. Students who are blind and visually impaired need to learn to, to optimize their listening skills to be able to, to listen when they can't visually appreciate what's around them in the environment. That can include listening to sounds in the environment. It can be listening to the teacher presenting a lecture in the classroom so that they can glean the important information from the lecture, or just to listen in a conversation. Um, when, when I walk with my young students in the environment, or, or even older students, I will often tell them uh, what's around them in the environment, and I'll ask them if I hear a sound, what that sound is, and see if they can stop and think about it and maybe determine what the sound is or where it came from. Quite often, there will be a couple of sounds that might be similar, and it's, it's good to help them learn how to differentiate between them and just to be aware in their environment. And of course, listening in, in for, for important information in a lecture can be an, a really important skill for students to learn. So we need to work with our students on developing their listening skills to the utmost. Using t new technology makes sense. Many of the kids may have smartphones. They appear, appear incredibly useful for people who are blind or experience low vision. I was just recently at a CSUN conference, which is a technology conference. I was at the American Foundation for the Blind Leadership Conference and California Transcribers and Educators with Visually Impaired. And at all of these conferences, they were talking about all the new technology in terms of smartphones, um, and iOS devices and Android devices. And these just really are opening up a world of information for people who are blind and visually impaired. Um, albeit, they need to be taught the skills to use these, these um, tools as well because they're somewhat intuitive, but they're um, often skills that need to be taught and um, mastered. Here are some creative ways to teach some everyday skills um, in the classroom. Lots of drama and role playing activities, singing, choir, and musical instruments. And children who are blind and visually impaired need to experience all of these activities just like their sighted peers. Um, and, and it gives them an outlet. It might focus on a skill that, that they really would like to cultivate and, and that they might um, enjoy for a career later in life or a hobby. So it's good to expose children to these kinds of activities. Other activities around cooking, allowing students to smell and touch herbs, spices, vegetables, fruits, seeds, and gra grains. Um, this person said avoid chilies, I guess because they're very pungent. <laughs> Washing up activities, let students smell, touch, and feel objects, clothes, water, and soap. Parents often don't allow their students to get involved in the kitchen or have chores, and I, I always advocate at um, our IEP meetings 
that, that parents need to give students chores around the house and have them participate in these activities. Washing dishes, sorting clothing, folding clothing after the laundry, making beds, um, along with all the other activities of daily living. But we need to just allow our students to experience as much as possible and uh, participate in the activities around the home. And here's a money saving tip. This is something that we use in our own program. Um, the quotation is, I make my own slant boards using a clipboard and a two to six inch binder using Velcro to attach the clipboard and some Rubbermaid non-skid shelf liner to the bottom. This helps save money as I often find these items for, for free at yard sales or if other teachers are getting rid of them. My students often do not want to use the standard slant board that we can purchase or um, some of the big book stands that are available and that's because they are too large and cumbersome. What I find works well in the classroom is to have the teacher pull out a, two, a three to four inch binder that they have already in the classroom and set it on the desk for the student to raise their materials up. Now as it says here we often will take that a step further and attach a, a clip to, to the uh, binder or some non-slip pads, um, some Velcro maybe to put the clips on so they can be taken off. But this is an easy way to provide a piece of equipment that students can use that will help them and save them from bending over to look at their materials and uh, prevent them from de developing back or neck pain when they have to look at their materials. So this is a good tip to um, use some in materials that you might already have in your classroom. Now here are some fun ideas for teaching beginner braille. Uh, one person has talked about using a six spot paint palette or half an egg carton with golf balls to represent a braille cell. I also, I did this with my students at San Francisco State University. I gave each of them a, a half of an egg carton and gave them ping pong balls so that they could practice making braille letters in their, um, their quote braille cell. Uh, I don't like to use this with students who are blind because I think it's difficult for them to transfer from the, the large model to a small braille cell. The braille cell should fit under your fingertip and you can't really do that with the, the egg carton. I think that it makes it difficult for them to see the whole uh, braille character. But, but it's definitely something I use with, with uh, sighted people, classes of my students and teachers to let them see how Braille is formed and in um, classes where I've been teaching Braille to sighted people. Another activity is an activity with graham crackers. When early Braille readers learn a new letter, they get to frost a cookie or a graham cracker and place M&Ms in the shape of a Braille letter and then eat the letter so they really know it. We, we all know that we learn by doing and you can show someone a Braille cell and how a letter is formed, but if they actually create it and make it, then they, they learn much, much better um, what the cell is like. There's also a, um, a tool out there that can be purchased. It's called a, a Papa cell, and you can actually pop a Braille cell in that. You push the, the um, bumps down and they depress or they come up depending on which side you're looking at, and that can create a Braille cell that way too. So that's kind of fun for students. And here are some tips on Braille instruction. First of all, Braille equals literacy and independence for people who are blind. There are those out there who say that Braille is going by the wayside, that it's no longer relevant, and, and I am in total disagreement with that statement. I think that, that um, we would never have our sighted students learn just by listening to their materials, so we wouldn't want to do the same thing with a student who's blind. I think it's important for them to learn Braille from an early age. Um, as I have, Most of my students are learning Braille in preschool before they come to my program where we serve them from kindergarten on. And the students need to learn to read hard copy Braille so that they develop their finger strength, their ability to, to manipulate and move around the page, their hand strength, and all of those are really important because eventually it will mean independence for them when they're older. Young students who are um, learning Braille need to learn that manual Braille before they move on to electronics and it will definitely help them when they begin to use an electronic device for, um, with a Braille display. This allows them to develop finger and hand strength, tactile discrimination, and they're also learning spelling and grammar, 
grammar skills by seeing actual Braille. If they were just listening to it, then they might not know how words are spelled or, or um, the configuration of a word. Um, another thing they learn is responsibility, taking care of their equipment, and, and um, that will translate to when they move on to electronic devices to be able to handle them properly. I like to braille the environment, and that means to put braille everywhere. Just as our sighted students are seeing words in their environment, we want to expose our young braille learners to literacy everywhere and bombard them with braille. So we, we put braille on anything that we think the student will encounter in the classroom, just so that they're getting a, um, this similar kind of experience that the other sighted students are having when they're seeing print in the environment. And as I mentioned earlier, narrate the environment as you walk with the students. It helps them associate sounds with actions around them. Uh, my favorite example is that if you have a young braille, um, blind student who is blind and their mother is cooking, let's say, uh, frying an egg or cooking bacon in the kitchen, the student doesn't make the association between that sound of frying, the smell that, that is originating from that frying pan, and then suddenly when they sit down to eat and there's bacon on their plate or an egg on their plate or something else. And so I think it's really important to teach parents that they've got to be talking through these things as they're doing them in their home. Um, and you can have that relate to anything from cooking in the kitchen to, um, to doing laundry or um, other activities, just so the students begin to associate the sounds that they're hearing in the environment with, with um, the end result or the actions that occur. Students also need to have a toolbox of equipment and materials that they can access appropriate for the task. So we would never give a student who is sighted just a pencil to use and nothing else, or just a computer for that matter. We need to provide them with a variety of materials. So sighted students have pencils and crayons and markers and paints and um, computers and iPads and, um, and the list can go on. Same thing with our students who are blind and visually impaired. Um, there's a picture on the, the slide of a slate and stylus. Students need to learn that skill. They need to learn to use an abacus. Um, they need to learn how to use a, a manual braille writer. And then they can move on to electronic devices and, and learn to use a braille note taker or um, a, a piece of equipment to, to listen to audio books. So we need to provide students with a toolbox of equipment and then they can choose the appropriate material for the appropriate task. One of my um, loves is tactile graphics, and I think it's really important to provide those to students, and also realia. And realia are real objects in, um, that associate with things they're reading about or hearing about. And I think these are key with young Braille learners. With my students who are in just learning Braille in kindergarten classes. If the class is learning about the beach, then we make sure we bring in those items. We, we bring in um, um, sand and a, sa a sand pail and a shovel and whatever we can, shells, to help them understand the concepts that the other students are seeing through the pictures that the teacher's reading in the book. I like to provide the classroom teacher with a, a kit to go along with a book that, that um, that are all the things that, that might be encountered in that book that the students are seeing in pictures and our students need to, to see in actual items. Uh, one time we had a book called The Pot and in the story they were putting in potatoes and carrots and tomatoes and different vegetables. So we got all of those items together and actually as the teacher was reading the story we, we had the students put those items in. And what we found is that it helped not only with our students who are blind and visually impaired, but it helped with students who were English language learners and just the, the comprehension of all the students in the classroom, giving them actual objects to help support the text. Um, tactile graphics definitely support concepts, reinforce concepts, and help students learn how to relate a, a tactile graphic with a real object. Um, or if they've gone on a mobility lesson, then they they can see that area where they walked in a, in a tactile format. Um, I, I like this one material that I use where, it, where there's a wooden block and in it fits a representation of a table. And when you, the student can take the table out and look at it 
and then it's just a small, you know, six inch table. And then you can show them a real table. And then once they slide the table into the block of wood, then they see a little edge um, form that ra that's raised up a little bit. And that helps translate into looking at tactile graphics or raised line um, um, drawings. Uh, it helps students to provide orientation on the page along with their peers. Oftentimes, teachers of young students will tell the students to find a particular picture on the, the page, and that's for orientation. And our students need the same thing. Instead of having a page put in front of them just completely covered with Braille, I like to put um, draw, draw, simple, simplified drawings on there for them to look at as well. It allows them something to color, or if the teacher says put a mark on the picture of the tree, then they have a picture of a tree to do the same thing. For, for quick drawings, I often make pictures with a tracing wheel. Um, we've used many foam shapes that are stick on, and then also swell touch paper with equipment that will raise those drawings um, instantaneously. That works really well. It's important to provide tactile games for students and also to, to adapt mainstream games with Braille and textures to allow students who are Braille users to participate with their peers in games in the classroom. I think it's important to teach functional Braille to students who are lower functioning. And I feel that if they can learn the alphabet, then we can focus on the alphabet signs. And that allows them then to be able to create simple sentences that they might not be able to write and spell on their own. And then ultimately, they, they've learned some functional Braille. They can mark the items in their environment when, they're, when, they're, uh, when they reach adult age. And that allows them independent access. For instance, if they have 10 cans of soup in their home, if they're able to put a letter on each of those cans of soup so they know whether it's chicken soup or um, beef stew or something else, then it allows them to be independent in selecting what they want to prepare to eat. I like to provide training to teachers to help them understand how Braille is learned and that the errors a student can make, such as Braille reversals. I've had teachers say to me before, well, if the student meant to write the word made, but they wrote M-A-F-E because they reversed the, B, B, or, I'm sorry, the D and the F, teachers think, well, how could they possibly think that the word made has an F in it? So I like to, when I'm interlining Braille, to circle those kinds of things and point out that this was a Braille reversal or help them understand that the student used the wrong contraction and help, help them understand what that is. I like to give teachers tactile markers so they can mark where the errors are for themselves. Then if the teacher writes comments, then I'll Braille those comments so the student knows and they can independently go back and edit their, um, their writing if it's um, in hard copy Braille. I like to give students a little card on their materials that show new Braille symbols that they might encounter in a, a Braille text. It's important to help parents also to know how their students will be working on Braille at home. And I've gone into homes and, and sat down with the parents to show them what the sheets look like that we're, we will provide in Braille. And we always put a print copy on top. And we try to make it look as much like the, the Braille look as much like the print copy so the parents can follow along. But I try to give them a basic knowledge of Braille so they can understand what their student is doing and um, help them with their homework just as a parent of a sighted child would do. At this point, I'd like to turn it back to Michelle. And she's going to talk about some products that help, could help with some of the, the um, tips and hints that we've just provided. Thank you, Patricia. That's been super helpful, and we're so excited that we had a, a real TVI on the line with us today. Um, I am going to talk um, pretty quickly about some of the products that HIMS makes for people with low vision or, or who are blind, and I'm going to concentrate on the features of each product that make it particularly well suited for a classroom or a homework uh, type of environment. So the first product I have on the screen right now is our Candy 5 HD2 handheld video magnifier. It has just recently been redesigned. It is super slick. Uh, it feels super slick in your hands. It has a very current design. But what makes it especially well suited for schools is the variety of different ways that you can use it. Um, it comes with a reading stand in the box so that you can place it inside of the reading stand, which is a separate component. 
Um, but that gives you a little bit wider frame of view. Uh, it's got a five inch screen on it. So if you use it in the, in the reading stand, you get a little bit wider frame of view, but you can also take it out of the reading stand and there's a little kickstand on the back of the magnifier itself so that you can place it down on top of the paper directly. There is a third way you can use it. If you pop the kickstand back under, it has a handle that will rotate out from behind and you can hold it in your hand, just like a lens magnifier, but with an electronic screen. Um, so that's another way you can use it. And then there actually are two other ways that you can use the Candy 5 HD. You can use the built-in self-view camera. So just like your iPhone has a camera that faces you and a camera that faces away, Candy 5 has the same thing. You push a button and it'll give you a self-view mode, which is great for students in the morning, especially high school students, if they want to put on some lip gloss or check their teeth after lunch or what have you. All of those grooming things, you can do that with the Candy and you can see yourself in a, a high magnification view. The other thing it can do, and you don't need to put it into any kind of special mode, if the student wants to view a map or maybe a periodic table of the elements that's on the wall, anything that's hung up on the wall, they can use the Candy 5 to view something at a near distance. And people ask, how close is a near distance? You don't want to use it to see the blackboard. That's going to be too far away and the picture isn't going to be that clear. But say you needed to see a menu in the cafeteria or like I said, a map on the wall, something six or eight feet away, that would be a great use for the Candy's near distance magnification. Um, it has a balance size. Obviously, it's quite small, so it's a perfect thing to stick in the backpack, bring it home for homework, bring it to school for schoolwork, carry it to the library for research. Super, super portable, and it's got a great crisp image with uh, a variety of different color contrast modes that you can set. Uh, and it also has an image capture. So if you need to capture uh, the periodic table, the abbreviation, you can capture that from the wall, take it back to your desk to do your work. Uh, and then our, our one of our new babies for the last year or so uh, is the eBot portable video magnifiers. And these come in three different models or three different flavors. There's the eBot Standard, the eBot Advanced, and the eBot Pro. Um, all three models will pair wirelessly to your tablet uh, or your Mac. Um, they will magnify near or far, and they fold down so that they're super easy to carry to and from home and school, which is one of the reasons it is especially well suited for a student or a school environment. Um, like I said, it will magnify near or far. You can have it at your desk. Uh, one of the great pluses to having an e in the classroom is because it has that wireless capability, your student could sit in the back row with their iPad where they're comfortable, where they don't feel like they've been ostracized or uh, made to feel special. And then this e could be at the front of the room so that the teacher could be changing what's under the camera. If they're using it in a near distance uh, view, especially with the eBot Pro, the teacher could put the worksheet under the camera and then the student can be way in the back of the classroom on the iPad. And with the eBot Pro, because that one, the, the main difference between the eBot Pro and the other two models, is that it has an uh, electronic controlled camera. So the remote control on the eBot Pro has a joystick so that you do not ever need to touch the camera when you want to move the camera up and down the page or even switch from the near distance view to the blackboard view at a distance. It's all done from the remote control or from the screen of the tablet that you're connected to. Um, they weigh only five to seven pounds depending on the model. So again, they're very easy to transport from home or to school. One of the most transportable magnifiers around um, and also one of the most durable, you can tell from the picture and if you get a demo in person, you can tell that it is a very well-made device and it has a pretty hardy arm that reaches up to the camera. So, um, and we found also too that you can knock the desk around quite a bit and the picture on the iPad really doesn't move or wiggle as much as you can tell the camera is actually wiggling on the desktop. So that's very exciting for kids that maybe like to kick their foot around under the desk. Um, 
Also, the EBOT Advanced and the EBOT Pro do have OCR built in. So if a student needs to check the text or is having trouble reading a certain passage, they can use the OCR to back them up to read that passage. Or with the EBOT Pro, they can use the OCR to read an entire page at a time, uh, which can make reading long text and long chapters a little bit easier on their eyes. And the Braille Sent U2, this is our Braille note taker made by HIMSS. Uh, it has a lot of features built into it that I sort of think should have been built into all of the note takers a long time ago. These are features that our sighted students have had access to for a very long time. Um, and many of these have been built into the Braille Sense U2 for several years now. One of the things that makes it really unique is that the Braille Sense U2 can be used as an all-inclusive computer all by itself. It has uh, Excel, PowerPoint, Dropbox, social media, Facebook and Twitter, which are not great during class, but are, are great tools after class. Um, and it's important that the students are able to socialize on the same level as their peers as well. Um, but also, if they need to use this device, say, for your standardized testing at the end of the year, the Braille Sense U2 has a unique lock feature where you could lock out certain apps. You can lock out specific apps as a teacher uh, so that you can make this a, an appropriate device for pairing with your standardized computer-based tests at the end of the year, which is a big deal. Uh, especially if the student is using this device for their homework during the year, having uh, a device during the test that they're already familiar with and not popping a new device in there at the last minute is really important for helping these kids to perform better on the tests. Uh, also, we've had for several years now, and, and we haven't done a great job about letting people know, but we've had for several years now, Nemeth support and UEB Braille support. So that's the, the new Braille format uh, that everyone is asking about, the UEB Braille format. And that is built in. You just need to go in there and switch on that table, and it's already in there. Uh, the Nemeth, again, it's something we haven't done a great job of letting people know about. But when a student is performing or is writing Nemeth math code into the Braille Sense U2, and they do this in the word processor so that they can show their work on more advanced math, when they hand that to their teacher and the teacher opens that up in Word, it looks like math. The fractions, uh, you know, three over four as a fraction will look to the sighted teacher as a three over four fraction. Um, on the other Braille note takers out there, you'll see it'll say three frac four uh, for a square root instead of the two in the superscript font, it'll say uh, squirt. It's S Q R T, it's an abbreviation. Uh, so on the Braille Sense U2, you won't get those abbreviations when you open the math in Word. You'll see actual what looks like regular math to, to sighted folks. It also has a built-in GPS and Compass and Google Maps, so when the student's ready to go on to college and they need to find their way around campus on their own, they've got that built into the device that they already know, that they're already familiar with. Uh, and you can create your own macros. So if you find that you're always doing the same uh, couple of keystrokes to do different uh, things on the Braille Sense, you can create your own macro really easily to save those keystrokes and to shorten that process for later. Uh, and here we've got a, a, a oldie but a goodie and a brand new product called the Smart Beetle. So the Braille, the Braille Edge has our, uh, is our 40 cell Braille display. It's been around for several years now. Uh, it does have some built in note taking abilities. So this is a Braille display that the student could take to class without a computer, without a tablet, with nothing else connected. They can take the Braille Edge to class and they can take some notes directly on the device. And it will save those notes onto an SD card so that when they get home they could transfer the SD card to their computer and work on their homework there. Or alternatively, if they're taking a test, um, they can put the answers down onto the SD card and turn that in at the end of the day as in a, in a way to turn in their test. Uh, it does have Bluetooth and USB connectivity, and it's got up to 20 hours of battery life, which is quite substantial. 
Uh, and then also our new product, the Smart Beetle, which is not shipping yet. It's still in beta, but it's super exciting. And people, as soon as they see it, as soon as they touch it, they say, oh my goodness, it's the cutest Braille display ever. It is a 14-cell Braille display. It really does fit in uh, the palm of your hand. It's larger than an iPhone, but smaller than an iPad. But the big thing that the, the feature that makes this the most unique out of all the displays on the market right now is the fact that it has five simultaneous Bluetooth connections plus one wired USB connection. And what we mean by simultaneous Bluetooth is that when you have, so you have a laptop and a tablet and a computer uh, at work and a computer at school, you can set all of those up uh, one time as a Bluetooth pairing and then if you get a text message in the middle of doing your homework, it's a simple key combination to switch from your computer over to your phone, answer the text message, pop over to the tablet, look something up online, and then pop back to your homework and put the answer on the page. So again, it's five different Bluetooth pairings that you can set in the device and you sort of set it and forget it and then you can tab through the different devices as you need them. Uh, and then this little bad boy has 24 hours of battery life, so it, it literally will last all day long. Uh, and then last but definitely not least are our new book players, the Blaze ET and the Blaze EZ. These are, uh, we've kind of coined a new phrase, we are calling these multiplayers. Uh, they're similar to the DAISY book players that the students are already familiar with, a lot of the teachers are already familiar with. Uh, except that they have a camera built in. So in the back of these devices, they have a camera that can be used for OCR. So that for the first time ever, our students have access to printed text on the spot, on demand, from within their portable book player that they've got in their pocket already. Uh, the two models, the Blaze ET and the Blaze EZ, the primary difference between the two is that the Blaze EZ has a very simple control panel. There's a power button on the top and then a record button and three buttons kind of across the middle, one for music, one for radio, one for book. Beneath that, you have your directional buttons, up, down, left, right, and enter, and at the bottom right, the OCR button. And that's pretty much it for the face of the device. On the Blaze ET, it has additionally a numeric keypad so that you can do a lot of the bookmarking and more advanced features that people are used to doing on some of the more advanced uh, book players. These have a, we call an advanced yet easy to use controls and file system. What we mean by that is that the files in this device, uh, when you go to move your books, your music, all of your files into either Blaze, you don't have to put the books in a book folder and the music in a music folder. You can pretty much just jump your files in there and the Blaze will sort them out and it will associate the music to the music button and the books to the book button and the book file system. They both have built-in Wi-Fi so that you can connect to the internet, you can listen to podcasts, you can download books directly from the internet, uh, and they support a wide range of file formats. I couldn't read them all, but you know, MP3, MP4, DAISY, NLS, Learning Ally, Bookshare, um, I've got them listed on the slide, and if anyone needs a list after the webinar, I'm happy to send that along. And we're going to open this up now for some q and I'm going to unmute Patricia. If anyone has any questions, if you'll type them in the chat window, I will read them aloud. Gabriel asked uh, or commented, I tested the eBot, and I loved it for my students. The Wi-Fi, he says, was a little temperamental with connecting to the iPad, but I figured it out and the students loved it. Uh, and pairing the eBot to the iPad, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it's different than what most people expect. And I, I probably should have covered this, but a lot of times when you're pairing a device to an iPad, you immediately think Bluetooth. And the eBot is not a Bluetooth connection. It actually does connect over Wi-Fi. So when you go into your iPad, it's sort of like you're connecting to the internet, but instead of connecting to a Wi-Fi network in your school, you're going to connect to a Wi-Fi network that the eBot actually creates itself. So it'll be making its own little Wi-Fi network, and you'll see it in there. It'll say eBot and have some numbers after it. 
Um, and then once you get the hang of it, it, it is pretty straightforward and it should remember that connection for next time. Terry wants to know, what is your suggestion for new TV eyes to learn about technology? Well, my response to that would be it's, it's really important for new TV eyes to learn technology that's out there so that you can work with your students. And, and that's one of the problems I think we've had in the field is is that sometimes teachers will, will learn how to use a piece of equipment in their university program or they'll be introduced to it, but they don't have in-depth training in how to use the equipment. I've advocated for teacher training with um, the organizations I, I'm involved in with AER and with AFB and also conferences that I've run. I've encouraged um, technology companies to come and do presentations so that teachers can learn how, how to use those pieces of, of equipment. Um, the American Foundation for the Blind also has a, a, an online magazine called Access World that can give you information about pieces of technology and reviews them and, and uh, talks about their, their use. Um, Really, the best way to become familiar with a piece of equipment is to, to get your hands on one and just learn all of the, the features and how to use them. And I think that's really important before you work with a student is to know what you're doing and, and how to teach them how to use the equipment. Once you get them a student started on equipment, they usually take off quickly with learning the features of the equipment. But as a teacher, you, you need to be versed in the, the pieces of equipment that you're introducing to students and then also to be able to help them troubleshoot. So I would say if you're interested in a piece of equipment, go to that technology company, for instance, HIMS, and, and um, have him show you how to use a piece of equipment. Their representatives would be happy to show you um, the use of an equipment, the features, and to help train you on use of the equipment. Something else you can do for technology training is make sure you go to the conferences and go in the exhibit halls and seek out the equipment that you're interested in and ask their representatives there to, to give you some help with them and spend some time looking at the equipment there. Okay, Gwen wants to know, have you ever attended an Envision conference and if so, would you recommend to attend? I haven't been to that specific conference, uh, but I think that we as TVIs need to access the conferences that, that are in our capability to attend. So if it's near where you live or you're able to be sent there by your, your um, agency or your school district, then you need, it's important to take advantage of, of those. I would say to go to any conference that you're able to attend because they offer a, a multitude of workshops and then also being able to go in and talk to vendors at the exhibit hall. I found too that attending, especially if you're new-ish to assistive technology, attending these conferences and seeing people in a real life environment using braille note tickers, using canes, seeing someone outside of a training environment using this technology is just eye-opening and it just it's like a light bulb goes off and a billion ideas enter your brain and I've just found it to be super helpful in, in just immersing myself in the environment. To go along with that, Michelle, I would, would add, if you know a, a um, proficient user of a, of a device, let's say a, a, a Braille note taker like the Braille Sense, and you want to learn more about it, ask that person who's a, a person who's blind or visually impaired and uses the device regularly to help you learn the, the um, skills to use that equipment. And Diana says, I've been doing online training through Skype, teaching students to use hymns and other note takers, and it's working well for teaching both reading and writing skills. Students already have a basic knowledge of Braille. That's very helpful. I know Skype, it seems, has gotten really popular over the last few years, and if you have students that are already familiar with a technology like that, and they're comfortable reaching out, that really takes down some of the barriers and lets you reach a little bit further in supporting some of these kids. I would agree with that, Michelle. I, in my area, I don't travel more than um, probably 10 miles to see students, but I know in some areas of the country, teachers have to travel hours or some even overnight to see students. And if they could use Skype or some other system such as that to, to do some training when they can't be with the student, then I think that's a really good creative use uh, of that technology. Gabriel wants to know, uh, with using the tracing wheel, do you also use braille paper? 
Um, on the tracing wheel, we use that on braille paper and we have some kind of pad underneath it so that the, the um, tracing wheel can impress the, the dots um, into the, the pad and that allows you to make the raised line drawings when you flip it over. You're, you're doing the tracing from the back. I've even used things like the carpet on the floor and I've used magazines, but, but most of the time I use a cork board underneath my uh, tracing wheel and my braille paper. Yeah, and I know that swell touch paper is very cool. The the machine that that heats up the ink and causes it to bubble up and bump up, I think is on it's kind of on the expensive side, but it's super cool to draw something flat on paper, put it through the machine and see it pop up. It's like watching bread rise, but on a little tiny little scale. I agree, Michelle, that's great. I've had students tell me that that when we can give them instantaneous pictures, with that that um, machine or technology that they're just so so happy to to have um, raised line drawings that they weren't able to access before. Uh, Gabriel says often in a pinch we will make a picture using uh, we will make a picture tactile using a hot glue gun. We used tactile graph paper last week to make graphs. We put tactile dots for data points and then traced the line in glue. I've seen that done. The hot glue gun works well. Um, sometimes I've seen people glue yarn or string or things like that, but unfortunately with those, you, you can't access them instantaneously. You have to wait for them to dry. Um, some people use wiki sticks. I'm not really a fan of wiki sticks because I find they don't really stay put, but that's another instantaneous way to provide a, a raised line drawing. And Gabriel says wiki sticks fall off. <laughs> yeah, they do. While we're waiting for questions, I do want to invite anyone who's interested to sign up for our future webinars at Sims H I M S dash Inc I N C dot com slash webinars. So you can go there uh, and see which webinars are coming up. I know we have one coming up on how to start or run a business using assistive technology, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and also, if you have ideas for topics that you'd like us to cover. Go ahead and email us at webinars at hims h i m s dash inc i n c dot com, uh, and if you have ideas, we would love to hear them because we're always trying to come up with fun new ideas on our own. And and uh, I think at this point, we would really love to have some feedback from you all. Lynn says new or for new TV for new TBVIs, what would you encourage skills that would be polished by the time the student transfers to college? That would be for students? Yeah, it sounds like she's wanting to know which skills should they look to master or polish by the time they're ready for college? Well, I think some of the things that we already mentioned in the webinar, organizational skills are critical. Um, re reading and writing skills, you need to have efficient writing skills when you're in college, so polishing up the, the um, ability to write efficiently. Um, uh, technology skills, of course, they, they are going to need to be versed in, in uh, technology using a Braille note taker, such as the, the Braille Sense, or um, using a computer, being able to that's a good way for students to communicate with their teachers is through email or, or um, electronically. And then also cane skills. They need to be able to get around independently in, in the um, college environment. Um, and lastly, of course, would be daily living skills. They need to be able to take care of themselves um, in their living environment, be, you know, cooking for themselves, cleaning up for themselves, washing their clothes, dressing themselves. Um, and, and having a, a, someone that they can count on as, a, as an advisor to help them match clothes if that's an, uh, something that they're unable to, to do themselves, just to be able to uh, check with someone, make sure that they're looking appropriate when they go out publicly. And then we had another question, what is HIMS plan for a new Braille Sense? Uh, and I don't know that there's a plan for a new Braille Sense, but we are always adding features to the Braille Sense U2, which is the current uh, iteration of the Braille Sense. We have the Braille Sense U2, uh, we have the Braille Sense U2 QWERTY, which has a QWERTY keyboard instead of the Perkins style keyboard, and then we have the smaller, I call it the kid brother, it's the 
uh, Braille sends you to Mini. And I think for right now, what we're doing is we're focusing on adding features to that hardware, which is already existing. So just recently, we've added the ability to work in multiple word processors at a, at a single time. So you can switch back and forth between uh, two different Word documents. We've added some of the password protection, some of the teacher functions. We've added uh, Dropbox and a lot of the social media applications are new for that. Uh, so I think our, our focus for right now is, is just adding features to the hardware that exists. Michelle, one other comment that I would add to the, the college readiness is that's important is advocacy. The person who is entering college needs to be a, um, a strong self-advocate and to be able to do that in an appropriate way to advocate for materials or different styles of instruction or um, access. So that's really important to add to the college readiness skills. Definitely. When these kids are coming out of school and they've got a whole team of people creating an IEP for them in the K-12 environment, when they go to college, depending on what college they go to, they may or may not have that type of a team support. So being a self-advocate is a, a really big deal. I don't see any other comments coming through. If anyone still has any comments, please go ahead and type them in. Um, this has been a really great webinar, and Patricia, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us. It's my pleasure, Michelle. And again, if anyone has any questions about the technology that we went over today, you can go to the HIMSS website. It's www.hims-inc.com. Um, you can also email, if anyone has a question after the webinar, you can email webinars at hymns-inc.com uh, and we will either answer it as best we can or we'll coordinate with Patricia to get you an answer. So I want to thank everyone for taking time to be with us. I want to thank Patricia for her time to be here with us today. Again, check our website for future webinars and let us know by email if you have ideas for other topics you'd like us to cover. So again, thank everyone for spending time with us on the webinar today. We hope to have you on a future webinar. And thank you so much, Patricia, for taking your time to be with us today as well.